not be closing out Abraham because uh, when we begin the new semester, we will move into chapter 16. But tonight we are going to have the transition from chapter 16. I guess you're recording. Are you recording? Amazing. Um, <clears throat> we will have a transition tonight uh, into chapter 16. And to do that, we need to <clears throat> go to the place where the transition is made into 16. And it's not chapter 15. It's chapter 12 which will give us the transition into chapter 16 because there's all there's um, much of the pertinent information pertaining to that pertaining to chapter 16 and chapter 12 some of it we discussed uh, but there are some very important parts that we never mentioned when we were in chapter 12 <clears throat> that will explain a lot of things so let's uh, turn to Genesis chapter 12. And we will begin with verse 10. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I apologize for all the coughing and choking and clearing my throat and everything. Usually that's over in 10 minutes once I start teaching and it hadn't been over with lately it's still an ongoing thing with drainage and with coughing and sleepless nights no but all of the stuff that goes along with it all right verse 10 and there was a famine in the land and abram went down into egypt to sojourn there for the famine was grievous in the land and it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. And she thinks she's getting a compliment. <laughs> you know, oh, guys, thank you. Well, there's a little more to it. Okay. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, wow. I mean, uh, this is his... <laughs> That they shall say, man, what a shame, isn't it, that you have to put up with my weird stuff. Um, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive in all your radiant beauty. Verse 13, say, I pray thee, thou art my sister. Does this sound like a good plan to anybody? <laughs> <laughs> You know, so all of the great things that you have understood about Abram, uh, he didn't even come close until he gets a name change, like in what, chapter 18? <laughs> so, that, so he will continue to show things that need the Lord. Can I put it like that? You know, like you, if, if Abram was here, we could say to him, you need Jesus. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, Verse 14, uh, oh wait, the last, well, let's do 13 again. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, for thy sake. Uh, part of the secret that we're going to get into is for thy sake, something we didn't talk about before. Robert, are you still feeling bad, brother? No. Okay. I've been praying. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, it's funny because I, I prayed that prayer that I sent you uh, all on my own, and then as I was looking over my notes, we're going to deal with some of that, and it's really good news, and that's probably why the Lord <laughs> moved immediately. So let's let's uh, let's look again here. Um, <clears throat> and my soul shall live because of thee. Uh, in verse fourteen, and it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld a woman that she was very fair. Um, the princes also of Pharaoh saw her. And command, commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman's taken into Pharaoh's house. Okay. So, 
I was told growing up, don't marry a pretty woman. Marry an ugly woman that can cook. <laughs> That's what I was told. I married a pretty woman that cannot cook. <laughs> In my rebellious ways. <laughs> and I do not regret it. <clears throat> well, she can cook all the way to burnt, you know. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Chris, you probably haven't heard this, but I say my wife treats me like a god. She gives me burnt offerings. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> All right, let us move on. Um, so there was all this talk about, <clears throat> you know, how good looking she was, how fair she was, how very fair she was. And, um, <clears throat> and of course, Pharaoh's like, I got to do something because everybody's talking about it. So um, he brings her into his house. And he entreated Abraham well for her sake. For her sake. That's the second time that's used. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. All right. So... You know, this is, this is not going the way Abram thought it would. God is like torturing. <laughs> yeah. And so, <clears throat> verse 18, And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Okay. So he's, he has figured out that this is not just random plagues that seem to be sweeping through the Egyptian empire, but rather God in relationship to what's going on here. <clears throat> why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Verse 19, why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Notice, I might have taken her to me to wife. Um, and also notice, um, she's my sister because there are things coming up in the story that is going to show that Abram wasn't lying. Hmm, the, the plot thickens. Um... Verse 20, and Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. All right. So one of the things we want to get into is where did, where did uh, Hagar come from? We discussed that in chapter 12 before, but we want to take a close, closer look. <clears throat> um, so there's this thing of say she is my wife, I mean, say that she's my sister, and, um, and he wants it to go well with him based on this. And um, Abraham could look at her, and I'm using a little different wording that he, he said here, but he could look at her and say, because of you, my life is spared on your account. Okay, now there's a couple of, couple of factors in there. Um, but I, I, wanna, I wanna just read some notes on this thing about his life being spared. Um, here we have our life spared. Here we have our life spared. Now is that the goal? Is that the goal for one who wants to bring forth the firstborn? <clears throat> we have our life spared instead of the life of the seed form. That's the, way, that's the view. This is Abraham's view. It is as if his life is the life of promise instead of him being the vehicle of that life. All right. This is important. 
But God spared Abram based upon what he will bring forth. Right? The seed. The promised seed. The one that God's talking about. To thy seed. Um, uh, he may not fully understand that fact at the time, but primarily he thinks in terms of God's care for only him in miraculous ways. Okay? So, um, that's was along the lines, though I wasn't thinking about these notes at that time, that um, Robert asked me to pray, and my prayer was basically on the basis of the seed that is within him. Because God loves his firstborn son. Even when he's not born yet, or can I say it like this, even when he hasn't come forth in you yet, he still, that's where his care and his promise and his all that is in his heart is for that seed. And we are what? We're the vessel. We're the vessel of that. We're the vessel of bringing it forth. We're the vessel of, of carrying that. And if you're born again, which I assume all of us are, um, you are already the vessel of that seed. You may just think in terms of, well, I got, I got born again, I got saved, um, and therefore God loves me, and he's going to take care of me, and everything that comes to me is going to be primarily based on the fact that he loves me so much, you know. <clears throat> and this is, seems like what Abram's doing here, um, that he is... Uh, moving, he is he's putting his hand to the chess game. <laughs> and he's moving pieces based on I'm important. Now, we've discussed this before, I don't know in which class or whatever, but, you know, I'm important, my ministry is important, this is all that's important to God. I'm more important to you because my ministry is more important to God. Okay. <clears throat> Your primary ministry is to bring forth Christ. That's the heart of the Father. And that's why he put him in. He didn't put, he didn't put him in there so that you could hide him under a bushel, but set him on a hill, you know. Amen. Let him be seen, in other words. Let him be the object of your heart that you are, that this is what you do. I was even praying about, Think, I was thinking about the gathering and gathering at his heart. And so I, was, I just went into prayer. And I said, Holy Spirit, your whole being, ministry, mission, everything is to glorify the Son. Right? Isn't that what Jesus said it would be? And to... <clears throat> to make you the object, make, to glorify you, to, to make uh, uh, everyone mindful that that's where your heart is and it's him. And I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, could you, could you work in me? Could it be you in me? Since you're, since you're always that way, you're always that way, you're always mindful of him, you're always... There's no, you, you never stray anything. Could you be that in me? Could you do that? And could you do it all the time so that Jesus gets glorified instead of me going off on thinking I'm something or whatever? And I thought, well, that's, <laughs> that's genius <laughs> because he, he never changes. You know, I didn't think that until after I prayed it and went, wow. If, you know, and I was serious because I, you know, as much as I believe that I do seek the Lord and want the Lord, there's nobody compares to the Holy Spirit. And, and, uh, and I said, nudge me so that I can move with you in that, you know. So that's not just, you know, cruise control and I'll just be what I am and you do this great thing, but rather... Help me to see your heart in different things, scenarios, so that I can see 
where I fall short in my thinking, how I will go off on something unknowingly, but it'll be about me or something. And, uh, and so then I had to make the rounds. Father, <laughs> Jesus, you know what I mean? And it's like, well, we already know that, but it was different when I prayed at this time. It was, it was like a recognition that I have in me the very one who always does that, who always, always thinks that way of glorifying Christ, and who is totally built for it, if you will. And I want, I want, I want more of him. I want more of his movement. I want more of his mind to be able to show me the mind of Christ. And so anyway... Um, I think that's a similar thing here that we're really talking about, and that is that um, Abraham, or Abram, he doesn't really understand what the plan is yet. He thinks it's about him, and he thinks it's about God. Okay, God, if you're just a, if you're just a man and you don't have a son, God wants to give you a child. Or we look back on it and we say, God wanted to establish Israel because that's, that's the seed. That's it. That's where it comes. So God wants to establish Israel. So he'll, he'll protect that. Or, you know, so many things, you know, that we see that in. Um, but what if we could just see it in a reality of, you know what? Everything the Father does, he does it towards his Son. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. Okay, so it's the, it's the Father, not God, blessing us. And the Father, if it's going to say the Father, then it's, there is an understanding that it relates to the Son. Okay? So then, if we could get to that place where our minds are not wrestling with, you know, um, or praying wrongly in the sense of, Lord, uh, do this, do this for me, or Lord, help me. And, um, and he said, the Holy Spirit bring to remembrance all that pertains to him. I mean, what a fountain that is. But we reduce him down. You know how we reduce him down. Well, during the worship service, particularly, we need you, but you can be dismissed after that. Or you can be here for the worship service and the word, but then after Sunday, I go back to it's, you know, it's all about me. <clears throat> and we may not even think that, but we do think that because that's the way that we pray and that's how we think. And, we, and when God does something, does a miracle or gives a blessing or something, we go, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for caring, you know. And, and I, you know, I believe he cares about the vessel. But you tell, let me ask Jim a question. Jim, when you get in the morning your first cup of coffee, in your favorite cup, what's more important to you? The cup or the coffee? The coffee, okay? <laughs> Amen. And that cup is just a vessel. And you may have one that's your favorite one. Most people that drink coffee do. You know, you have a cup that's your favorite cup for coffee. Sometimes it's dirty and you have to use another cup because you haven't got around to doing the dishes or something like that. But, but ultimately, really and truly, that doesn't matter when you've got the cup in your hand. You're just going, okay, yeah, ah, that's good, you know. <clears throat> well, we're, we're not thinking that way. We're thinking that I'm the cup that he loves. I'm his favorite cup. <laughs> and he's going, 
even if you are, you're still not him. You're not Jesus. Dude, you got him in you. You, you know God talks like that. He says dude and stuff, right? <laughs> it's just the Bible wasn't written during these times. So, <laughs> so he says, thus saith I unto thou. Drink the coffee. <laughs> Stop chewing on the cup. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, we too may give little thought in our lives concerning his divine care toward us being about his desire for his firstborn son to come out of us. In other words, it is we think it's focused on us. And we think we can have a certain amount of, sh of assurance. You know, the assurance should all pretty much relate to him on some level, either what he did at the cross or, you know, blessed assurance, you know. I'm doing just fine. <laughs> oh, what a foretaste of glory is mine. <clears throat> Instead of glory divine. Um, heir of salvation, purchased above. Oh, my God. You know, no wonder we're messed up. <laughs> every song and every book and everything, not every, but you know what I'm saying. We, we get all of this training and stuff, and then we go out and, yes, I'm ready to face the world for Jesus. You know, you are the world until Jesus is formed in you. You know what I mean? You are dead to the world, you know. Okay. Um, uh, we are very self-focused and not seed-focused. Amen? Not seed focused, not seed aware, not um, seed conscious. Um, we are Jesus conscious, but not seed, which is the firstborn. You, you see what I'm saying? We're, we're, we're conscious that 2,000 years ago, a guy named Jesus walked the earth and he was the Son of God, and now he's up there. And we're very conscious that. For sure, for many Christians, we're more conscious that he's up there than he is in us. I'm not saying we don't believe that he's not in us, but we're more conscious. Oh, God, here's how we look. Oh, Jesus, you know. He's going, I'm in here. <laughs> you know, but that's what we do. That's what we do. <clears throat> so... Um, if to God Sarah represents the bride since, uh, since she is barren. In other words, he, he's not moved by the fact that she's barren. He's not moved by the fact that you're barren, if you are, or dry, or whatever word you want to use. He's not, he's not moved by that fact. He, he's God. He knows that I chose a barren woman. I didn't choose the most fertile in the land. I chose a barren woman. And she's going to be, because she will not be going, oh, I did this myself. You know, it's not going to happen. It's going to be, I could not have done this. It wasn't in me. I had no ability. Okay, well, we know that, but are we convinced of that in relationship to ourselves? Uh, have we recognized that we are a barren vessel unless God brings forth his son? You know? Well, there's hope for me yet. Okay, well, God will have to deal with you a little longer so that your hope is in God the Father wanting his son. Okay? Okay? Um, so if, if she is that in God's heart, even though she's barren, if she's a bride or if she's going to be the very vessel that brings forth this seed, Abraham doesn't take into account what will happen to her when he says, run along now with, with Pharaoh's 
guards or whatever, run along. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, he, he, he just looks at her like she's barren. He, Abraham, he just looks at her like she's barren. There's basically, she's not in the plan, if you understand that. She's not in the plan. So, look, the, the one that's in the plan is me. Can you see Abraham thinking that way? The one that's in the plan is me. You are, you know, are really not even, you know, part of it. So do what you can to save me. <laughs> it's bad, isn't it? It's really bad. You know, I mean, I've seen pastors that they go, you know, all these people in the church here are really because I'm a man of God. Or, they've, I've heard it said, put another way, I am God's anointed. Okay, the word anointed means Christ. You're God's Christ? Well, I mean, it does mean that. You're God's Christ? And all of these people, God has sent all these people to make me successful. In the Lord, of course. But it's still me, successful. And then the finances that come into the church, they're for me so that I can be taken care of, you know. Some of you guys may not realize, but in the 80s, I quit taking a salary from the church. I haven't had it since 86 or something like that. Um, as far as the salary for what I was doing all those years. Because, why? Because we understood, we, not just me, we understood that what we needed to do here is make room for those who would bear the seed. So we made room where there would be places for people to stay and live and we could, we could fellowship and we could have an environment where that life could grow in us and come forth and everything. And, you know, and it would take forever to try to pay off this property, you know, Otherwise, because why? Because we ain't rich, <laughs> and we never have been. <laughs> so, you know, that's not glory to me. I believe that's the Holy Spirit working on me, just like he's worked on you to, to, to move down here and live here and, and give up all kind of things that, you know, you could have done. And gotten a lot of adulation probably I mean I personally I believe Mallory's probably the best flute player I ever heard Kelly sent Deb a a song that she did on Sunday and while Kelly's singing this flute comes in like a breeze from the Holy Spirit just soft enough to just fill and lift everything even higher than what it was and, you know, she could, she could be in, you know, orchestras or whatever, all this stuff. But she chose death that's life, you know. Yeah. And uh, I don't believe she or any of you will ultimately be regretting this if the seed keeps coming forth in all of this, you know. And one of the things you do recognize, because you've heard me say it before, <clears throat> but, you know, we're no faster than the slowest sheep. We, you know, the slowest sheep usually is some that are new, that are not, don't have it all down. They're not running up here, you know, and da-da-da-da. <clears throat> They're still part of the flock. And all of it, we all flow together. Because I've had people say to me, well, these these couple of people are slowing us down. We're trying to get on here with the Lord, and these people are slowing us down. <laughs> these people are part of the flock. They're part of God. They're God's sheep. They're not mine. That's what David said. He said they're God's sheep. <clears throat> they're not my sheep either. So if, that, if those slow ones bother you, then you probably need to go find you another place where you can run free which usually sounds more like a jackass than a, a sheep. Excuse my French. 
Well, it does in my mind. See, you got to remember, I, I spent those years in Jamaica too, and I saw some of those too. So anyway, <clears throat> um, um, Abram doesn't take into account what will happen to her. And since she is barren, he probably concludes that she is expendable and has no part in fulfilling the promise. Let's not look at one another like that. I don't care how bad or how short somebody seems to come at different times. We can't do that. We can't do that. The God's promises, if they're born again, they've got the seed. God's going to do everything he can, the Father is, to get his son. And you can be assured of that. Okay, well, they've already messed up three times. You know, in Texas, three strikes, you're out. <laughs> it's true. That's a law <clears throat> of which I'm very mindful. But <laughs> um, <laughs> whoopee. Uh, in his mind, he may only be protecting himself since he sees himself as the most important piece of God's scenario. The most important piece of God's scenario? This is Father Abraham, the one you worship. Mordecai, whom you lifted high above. Anyway. <clears throat> um, but here's the good news. Even if... If he thought every ounce of this, yet he will at the right time lay down the seed so that it can go into death and be the fulfillment of all that God had in his heart. So let's not worry too much about Abram. Okay. He will be the father of a multitude. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, for this reason, he doesn't consider her view of his plan. Therefore, we never see any of the emotional impact any of this has on her either. Um, I was thinking about it today. Um, uh, <clears throat> I had a whiff of the Holy Spirit once, and I don't know if it's true or whatever, but um, I was thinking about, you know, Larry, my good friend, passing away, and, and uh, I felt like, and I, I will not say for sure this is what I heard, but I felt like I heard the Lord say to me, you're going to, you know, you're going to bury all your friends. You're going to be the minister that buries them, you know, which is not, you know, I was wanting to check out way early before then. Um. <clears throat> And I felt the sadness, if that, if that never happens, I felt the sadness of that. I felt the sadness of, oh, you know, I mean, I, I've been blessed to have a lot of good friends. So if you're one of them, <laughs> this should worry you. <clears throat> yeah. And so, you know, I'm going, I don't, that's the last thing I want, you know. And I even, I've even told Mike before I had that wisp. <laughs> I told him, well, well, brother, it looks like you're going to be doing my funeral. <laughs> He's going, no, Randy, you're going to live to be. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, with that thought and with that feeling of the ones that you love and that you've been close to for so long, came the thought of what did God feel when David died? I mean, we never think of that. See, it's another example of we never think of it from God's perspective. We always think of it from ours. And we read the story from theirs and, you know, what did Israel do? And, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, it says a few things about David and being buried and, you know, you know, that there was some honor and stuff like that. And probably a lot of sadness on some fronts. But what did it feel like to, to God when David, in that sense, he had no more seed of David in the earth. It wasn't the, no longer him there. Now we say, well, he was with the Lord. But I'm seeing it as he's actually experiencing the death 
and what he had in the earth and what was brought through that man who, who had a heart after God and thought in terms of the Lord first and always, you know, he first one of the first things he wants to do is bring the ark back into Israel and then brings it and sets it on Mount Zion and says he's, you know, he built his house there and then they put the, the the tabernacle of David in his backyard and most of the Psalms and stuff that he wrote weren't things when he talks about in the tabernacle of God or in the sanctuary I saw da 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 you know all the Psalms that say stuff like that it's in this tent in his backyard and he's going in there the father's going come on in you know he doesn't strike him dead that's the holy of holies <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the father's going, come on in, you know, and they're spending so much time together. And, and David is, is, what is he doing? He's not going, well, this is deep stuff. I need to write this down. He's writing songs that he's singing out of his heart to the, to the Lord, you know. <laughs> and so then he dies, and on that day, you know, I've got nobody like David. It's going to turn bad. You all know what happened after that. It's going to turn bad now. It's going to turn bad. You know. So, so Abram is looking at Sarah and just kind of marking her off. She's barren, so there's, there's no way. And we cannot do that. You cannot do that to yourself. And you cannot do it to others. And if you've done it to others, you need to repent. Just say, Father, I'm with you on your spirit, and I just want to be with you here. You know? No matter how bad someone messes up, we stay with the Father's heart. And that's why I wrote, for this reason, Abram do, uh, doesn't consider her view of his plan. Therefore, we never see any of the emotional impact any of this has on her. That's real. That was real. And that was only done because Abram thought about himself and thought, well, I'm the important piece here and she, she's expendable. Really? Can we be the expendable one that goes to the cross so that others may live? Can we have that heart? Or are we going to just shove, you know, you know what's, what's that old joke about two guys sitting in a big open field in Colorado and they're having a picnic, you know, and, and uh, they got their shoes off enjoying the sun and all of a sudden they look way over there, way down there and there's this big old grizzly bear running with all his might headed toward them. And they go, oh no, and they start putting on, or one of the guys starts putting on his sneakers and the other guy says, you can't outrun a grizzly bear. And he said, I don't have to. And he goes, what do you mean? He goes, I just have to outrun you. It's kind of funny except for God forbid that we, you know, that that be our spirit. I'll save myself because I'm important. You know, and if I can outrun you, then you're bear meat. <clears throat> so Abram gives his wife into the harem of Pharaoh. However, defiling Sarah is not part of God's plan with Pharaoh's seed. Amen. <laughs> Amen, amen, and amen, amen. But neither is part of his plan to have Abram come up with his own plot of self-preservation. That's not God's plan, to come up with your own plot of how you can preserve yourself and someone else will lose out. Uh, God will have to intervene, not because Pharaoh was wrong in the issue, but because Abram was seeking to save. He's going to have to now move, and we go, we go, uh, oh, he's moving on my behalf because I was messed up. No, he's moving on behalf of his seed. We, are, we draw it to ourselves. Oh, this is about me. Well, this is, you know. <clears throat> I, 
you know, and people say, well, are you saying God doesn't love me? Oh, no. God, God loves you. By this perceive we the love of God, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He loves you, and he wants you to do the same thing. <clears throat> so how does God... How does God move in order to rectify the situation? In Egypt, God releases plagues on Pharaoh, similar to what happened in Exodus. But there are differences. In this case, in Genesis with Abram, God wants to preserve his seed that would come through his earthen vessel. At this point, well, I'll, I'll read it in a second, but at this point, you have to preserve the vessel. You know? There's a time to preserve you because the seed hadn't fully matured yet. So he preserves you, but still with <laughs> that seed in mind. Okay? <clears throat> but in the case of Abraham's seed in Exodus, God wanted to offer up his seed, remember? That was all about them, the firstborn being put in a position where they would live according to the nature of the lamb that they ate. <clears throat> God may do a lot of preserving in the lives of those who are his, but only on the basis that his hour had not yet come. Remember? Jesus. Even Jesus, he, he preserved him here in this situation, in this one, in this one. But Jesus always said, mine hour has not yet come. I know why I'm here. God's preserving me for this. This isn't because I'm special or because da-da-da-da. It's just that he's preserving me for the time when I can show forth the firstborn, not just Jesus of Nazareth. Right? Amen. So he does that with you. And you should say, whew, praise God, my hour has not yet come. <clears throat> his ultimate goal is first to reveal his son at the cross and then that we might partake or eat of the lamb and be and have him have his nature at work in us to be slain for others if you will not physically but you understand what we're talking about in the story it appears that pharaoh is shocked that abraham lied about his wife sarah he is indignant <clears throat> so, uh, pharaoh seems more honorable than abram um, All right. Uh, remember up here where it's talked about um, that he spared, let's see if I can find my spot up here. that it may be well with me for thy sake. Um, and then that's verse 13 in uh, chapter 12. And then verse 16, and he entreated Abraham well for her sake. Okay, we, we emphasize a little of that, but here it comes. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. Okay. I believe that all of that stuff wasn't given randomly or because, you know, Sarah looked good and he went, well, I wouldn't want you to do without or something like that. I believe it was like a dowry, you know, that, that Pharaoh is took her into his house and he's saying, okay, she's mine and here I want to give you all of this for your sister. Do y'all know what a dowry is, by the way? All the girls do. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the, well, in the old days, but apparently it must still be alive because we're hearing the young ones talk about it too. Um, when you would get married, uh, the... Um, the husband's family, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, gives this dowry or all this gifts to the, 
to the guy. Is that right? Wait a minute. No. What? To to the male guy. Right. And it, but it would be basically the wife's stuff, right? It's the wife. The dowry is given to the wife, really, ultimately, isn't it, or what? Okay. Well, anyway, the point being that this was um, basically a gift to Abram for giving him his sister as his wife, Pharaoh's given Pharaoh his sister as his wife. So this is why it says this was all done for her sake or because of her, all right? So then we have, um, well, let me read this. The thought behind Abram getting all the riches when he left Egypt is that they came from a dowry that Pharaoh promised to Abram prior to discovering that Sarah was really his wife. That would make sense why the scriptures declare her the reason for the newfound wealth given by Pharaoh. Is that, does that make it clear then? Okay, so I want to read um, um, Genesis 12, 15, and 16. <clears throat> the princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house, and he entreated Abram well or he treated Abraham well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen, and he asses, and men servants and maid servants, and she asses and camels. All right, so I want to uh, now read uh, Genesis 16:1 because we're trying to make a transition to Genesis 16. And it says, Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. So we know, we already said this before, that she came from this. She came from this time in chapter 12. Okay. Um, but I want you to notice the, the wording here when it says in chapter 12, men servants and maid servants. In 16, one says, now Sarah had a, uh, Abram's wife, bear him no children, and she had a handmaid. That's the same exact Hebrew word as maidservants. <laughs> well, it would make sense, wouldn't it? Because all of this is given as a dowry. And in this case, it was given to her. At least Hagar was. Okay. And maybe that's why she got she asses and cows. Maybe it's because of the girls. I don't know. I'm joking. Okay, <clears throat> that, okay, so that being said, I need to move on here and try to get this over with. Um, oh, we did go a little late, though, didn't we? Yeah. Chapter 12, that's where we've been at. Okay. <clears throat> it's the Lord for me. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so... <clears throat> so we saw the reaction of Pharaoh when he was angry and he said, uh, take your wife and get out of here, right? <clears throat> um, he'd already promised the dowry and given it. This guy, this Pharaoh seems to be pretty noble in a lot of ways, you know. He really does. I mean, he's like rebuking Abram and going, you know, you're, <laughs> you're pretty sleazy, dude. <laughs> <clears throat> so they were expelled from Egypt as though they, had, they were bad people and not because they were godly. Right? They are expelled from Egypt as if they're the bad people, but they're the ones who are going to carry the seed. Okay? But they're made to look bad. Hmm. All right. This is Egypt's viewpoint of them based on the knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of life. In a way, in the Exodus, Israel, they stood um, as Israel as Egypt expelled Jesus to the cross. So, so it's like Jesus was expelled to the cross. Well, basically, Pharaoh, in pretty much both cases, and in fact, the wording is actually when he says, go, go your way, 
It's actually not in the Hebrew, go your way. It's, it's like, go. It's like emphatic, go. It, there's that feel that your escape go. <clears throat> okay? Um, they stood as Israel um, as, and as his seed, which was Jesus being, as it were, expelled to the cross. Abram, in this story, as well as his seed in the Exodus story, stood as a form of a scapegoat, which was cast out. Okay? They were as that which is dishonorable and rejected. Okay, that makes perfect sense <clears throat> to the Word of God, anyway. It doesn't make perfect sense because we're going, well, why are we the bad guys here? You know? Well, yeah, Abraham did do all of that stuff, but to Pharaoh, he had morals he had ethics maybe he didn't have god but he had morals and ethics and to his morals and ethics you're a bad person and get out of here leave egypt see we went abraham left and he went back to the to the land you know it's like <clears throat> no get out of egypt <clears throat> get out of dodge anyway so um they were as that which is dishonorable and rejected. Adam and Eve were also expelled from the Garden of Eden. Right? Okay. It may have appeared that it was done by God on the basis of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But instead, they were cast out on the basis of not having had not having any of the tree of life inside of them. Should I read it? Yes. We'll close with this. Genesis 3, 22 through 24. <clears throat> Genesis 3, 22 through 24. Y'all turn, I drink. And the Lord God said, Behold, the, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, so he's saying they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> and it almost sounds, based on what he's about to say, that we, we can leave them in the garden, even though they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We could leave them there if there wasn't this thing called the tree of life. Right? That tree of life was the issue. As far as being expelled. Remember, that's what we're talking about, being expelled. Okay? <clears throat> um, therefore, lest they eat and live, therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cher uh, cherubim, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. What is it that's in God's mind? We always think it's sin. We always think it's failure. We think he, he's going, you know, get out of here because you've ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But he's saying, yeah, you shouldn't have. You, that was disobedience. But it sounds to me like he was going to leave them in the garden until... He thought about it and went, you know, and here's, here's my statement. So I'll read the whole paragraph. It's short. Adam and Eve were also expelled from the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> it may have appeared that it was done by God on the basis of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The expelling on the basis of that. That's the point. And we talked, you know, Abram being expelled and Israel being expelled. <clears throat> Um, but uh, an evil, but instead they were cast out on the basis of not having any of the tree of life inside of them. Okay. Well, God doesn't want them to put it on the inside of them now when they're already full of this other thing. But he's not, he's not rejecting them and pushing them out on the basis of you aided the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The garden sounds like 
the place God seemed to hang out, right? He walked in the garden in the cool of the evening. These, these, this is what the scripture says. And there he communed with them. Sound like they were still going to be in there, but he said, no. We can't mix this. And besides, the thing that I wanted was this over here. And they don't have that in them. And so they must be expelled for now. But with all hope. Remember what, what the hope was? They were covered with skins. And then there was a promise. The seed. The seed. The seed. <laughs> Glory to God. I mean, is our God amazing? Yes, is. is our Father true to his Son? And even though, because I believe that his Son, rep, the tree of life, represents Christ and him crucified, <clears throat> they're going to need that, but he's going to need to die for them to bring them in, and then they're going to need to eat of that tree, which is him, so that they're like him so that they will become trees of life. I don't have time to go into all that because we're basically done. <clears throat> but he never gives up on his seed. He, you know, you could even say he gives up on us, but you could always say back to him, but you put, you put, I didn't put Jesus in there. You put him in there. And I do want him to come forth. Even if everything I seem to do and say seems the opposite of that, I'm telling you that I do want this seed to come forth. And he's not going to go, nah, you're ignorant, you know, whatever, duck. I'm not going to listen to you quack all day long, <laughs> you know. He's, he knows the seed is in there. Amen. He knows you're not bluffing. <laughs> he knows that he can do things you can't do. Because, you know, I mean, Abraham could have said that. You know, I got the seed in me now, and I know I'm messing around in Egypt and doing all this stuff, and, and there's this Hagar thing, Ishmael. And, but the seed, you, the seed is in me. You said it is. And you said you want the one that comes out of me, not, Amen. you know. So... Let's work together toward that end. Where I'm not open, make me open. You know, where I'm off, get me on track with your heart. Get me in tune. It's just a, it's a beautiful thing. It's really not a fearful thing. It's a beautiful thing. But we have to look at it from his heart, not, well, he cast him out of the garden and that's it and he don't care. That's not his heart. Father, we thank you for these times of gathering here to hear your word, to seek you, to want your word that goes forth to be seed in us and want it to uh, bring forth the life of the true seed that is in us, that the word, that the, that the scripture will match the word and then the living word will come out of the scripture. Father, the seed of the scripture that goes into us, may, may it be watered and turn into the growth of the seed of the word, your son. Help us to fight off the buzzards, Father, that try to take away our only hope, which is the altar and the sacrifice that has been given there, and try to take you, Jesus, off of the altar and then just leave us alone in the darkness. So we resist those fowls of the air that only, only make us fear. And we draw near, we draw near. You told us to draw near boldly, not because of us, but because of your heart. Not because we're confident we're not. Our confidence is not in ourselves. Our confidence is in you and in your son and in the desire for your son and for the firstborn to be manifested in mortal flesh. 
We love you. We thank you and we tell you that our hope is Christ in us, not us. We are earthen vessels. We thank you. Thank you for the son. Thank you for the firstborn. In his name, amen. All right, run free for...